Good evening, everyone. I'm Joey Manson, and I'm the Center Director at the Seward Park Audubon Center. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, I want to first off thank all of our supporters and volunteers for making events like this and others possible. At the Seward Park Audubon Center, what we try to do is connect students and everyone else in our community with ways to protect birds and the places that they need to thrive. Many of the programs that our center delivers were created by our first education director, Annie Morton. She created curriculum for our school programs, mentor, mentor, mentored many young people who are now working in the fields of conservation and education, and created pro community programs like tonight's program that connect people from Sewer Park and beyond with insightful events that connect them to the natural world. Annie was the heart and soul of our center, which is part of her legacy. Annie now lives in Tennessee, where it is nine o'clock right now. So thank you for staying up, Annie. And we are so excited to welcome her back, if only for a little while. Um, our host for tonight's program, Annie Morton. Okay. Oh, there we go. Hi. So thank you very, very much, Joey. Um, I am very happy to rejoin our Seward Park family and community this evening. Um, first and foremost, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Joey gave me some things that I wanted to, to clear up for everybody. Um, virtual housekeeping. I gave up regular house cleaning somewhere around, I don't know, February 200th. So just some issues. Um, first and foremost, please forgive me. I've been retired from the center for I think eight years now, and I've been relishing the opportunity to spend less time in front of a computer and a lot more time out on my farm. Um, so instead of grant reporting and data crunching, these days I spend a lot of time outside um, with my goats and my sheep and my honeybees um, and just relaxing. So. I am hoping that you guys will give me a little bit of grace tonight if I bungle a few things technologically um, and just relearn how to communicate with normal people. So that's one. Two, as a continuance of that grace, please do me a favor and submit your questions via um, the text box and the, the chatter box. Um, that way I can write them down and we can talk with Thor at the end of his presentation about those questions. Um, He's going to take about 30 minutes to give his presentation, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. And then after that, we'll work through all the different questions we have. So if you get a chance and you're thinking of it, particularly while he's giving a particularly interesting um, topic, just write them in there and then I'll write them down and we'll come back to them. OK, the next note is I'm reading this one because Joey was very specific. This program is being recorded for those who would like to share it with friends or family or even watch it again. And this is my part. Joey promised me that I'll have it on the Seward Park Audubon Center Rewind page tomorrow morning. I don't know actually what that means, um, but it will be there and I'm sure he'll send us all a link and someone should also send me like very simple instructions, someone that a goat farmer can follow right now, okay? Um, and then last but not least, buy some of Thor's books if you get a chance. Um, you don't have anything else to do, so go buy some books and read them. Um, support his work. If you've read Buzz, which is a wonderful, wonderful book, um, you'll know that there are mice in his writing shed eating the bee um, nest, the bumblebee nest, so he needs a little bit of support. Um, so please, please, please buy his books. They're at Elliott Bay. And third place books locally for those of you still in the Pacific Northwest. And if you're like me and you never actually leave your home, you're also welcome to buy them online. Um, I leave and look today on thrift books and there's quite a number of them available there. So that's a little housekeeping. Thank you for your patience. Now the formal introduction. I did write this part down because as I say, I'm a little rusty. So a long time ago in a city far, far away, a fledgling Audubon Center needed some charismatic megafauna to join our new author lecture series and draw in the masses. Um, we needed someone smart and fun, someone able to command a room, someone local, and someone kind enough to help our huge dreams on our small budget. Um, enter Thor Hansen. He fit the bill perfectly. He was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest and when he's not out gallivanting around the world conducting research and interviewing some truly fascinating scientists and biologists, he still lives there with his wife and son on one of the islands near you. He's first and foremost a thoughtful and curious conservation biologist, but he also has the gift of gab. His books are very well written and a lot of fun to read. 
all over the world studying um, things like Central American trees and songbirds, nest predation in Tanzania, the grizzly feeding habits of African vultures. He served in the U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Uganda, where he's helped establish the Mountain Gorilla Tourism Program. And he's also helped manage a brown bear tourism project for the U.S. Forest Service. Um, he often works at the interface between natural and human systems as conducted research on habitat fragmentation, endangered species, and the ecological impacts of warfare. He's the author of Buzz, which we're going to discuss tonight, Triumph of Seeds, which is my personal favorite. I'm not saying that you have to read that one, but you should read that one. It's really well done. Feathers, if you're one of our bird nerds, welcome back to our community. We're so happy to have you. And Feathers is a really, really well done book on um, birds. The Impenetrable Forest, and as well as the illustrated children's favorite Bartholomew Quill, which I have not had the access of to yet, and I'm going to order it because I want to know. He's the recipient of many scientific awards and accolades, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Switzer Environmental Fellowship, and his writing is also award-winning. It includes prestigious as the John Burroughs Medal, the Phi Beta Kappa Award in Science, and several Pacific Northwest Book Awards. Um, and if you get a chance, he has a really well done website. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about him and his work, particularly his conservation biology, um, his conservation work is really fascinating. You should check out his website. Um, so in spite of being a honey beekeeper myself, and you guys, this is really good, ready? And therefore feeling a few stings during my own reading of Buzz, get it? I'm very honored and excited to introduce Tor Hansen for his encore presentation with Seward Park Audubon Center. Please join me in welcoming Tor back to our Audubon community. Thank you, Annie. How nice to see you again. And Joey as well. I want to thank everyone at Seward Park Audio for inviting me to return in this virtual format. You can see I'm here uh, in a shed outside of our house where I've got a, a kerosene lantern glowing. Uh, we're, we're offline out here, but uh, enough battery power, hopefully, and enough of our feeble island internet, uh, hopefully, to get through tonight's presentation. Uh, anyway, it is, it's fabulous to be here. Thanks to everyone out there for tuning in. And of course, Today was a little chilly, it's a little chill in the air. The leaves are starting to turn and we're here to talk about bees, but you might be thinking, ah, oh, bees are, they're a little bit out of season, aren't they? But you know, you can still see, if you keep your eyes peeled, a few big fat bumblebee queens out, even today on a warm, uh, warm flower someplace, tanking up, getting all the nectar they can before they buzz around and find some nice little spot in the soil or underneath some leaf litter to tuck themselves in for the winter. And of course, all winter long on warm afternoons, people like Annie might be lucky enough to see uh, their, their honeybees coming out, venturing forth on chilly days. But if there's enough sun and they can get out, they'll go and look for the odd flower. Or sometimes they just leave the, the hive just to uh, relieve themselves. Uh, and if you look around in any landscape, look out your window, any landscape at all, there are hidden bees all winter long, tucked away in their nests in the ground or in, in bits of wood or hollow twigs. There are bees there waiting for warmth and flowers of springtime. So really any season is bee season for the enthusiast. And if you are an enthusiast like me, and you must be or you wouldn't have tuned in to this lecture, then you've probably been alarmed really, maybe even a little shocked by all of the stories about bees in the news lately from whole honeybee colonies collapsing uh, to steep declines in many other uh, species of bees from bumblebees to a lot of the native solitary bees. A lot of trouble for bees in the news these days. And I read those stories too, but I notice in there a certain, shall we say, mushiness about the subject matter. I mean, what do we really know of bees? Even the experts sometimes stumble over the details. I was driving in my car not too long ago, uh, listening to the radio, to, you know, news program there, and they were interviewing a very noted historian of science who made the point that when the colonists were arriving at Plymouth and Jamestown, they brought with them honeybees from Europe which is true. 
the honeybee is a European and African species, the domestic honeybee, that part is true. But then he went on to say that if they hadn't, there would have been nothing here to pollinate their crops. At which point I nearly drove off the road. What about the 4,000 species of native bees already buzzing happily around North America? I couldn't believe it. But that's not the worst of it. Given my interests, it won't surprise you to learn that I keep a, a copy of the book Bees of the World in my office. And it's a nice hardbound copy of a good edition of the book uh, written by two very well-regarded entomologists and it's published by a good nonfiction press. And the, and the cover features a lovely close-up photograph of a fly, a fly a fly on the cover of bees of the world. So here in the 21st century, we find ourselves really in a peculiar position where we know perhaps more about the plight of bees from what we read and hear in the news than we know about the bees themselves, which means that the place to start in any exploration of bees, whether it's a book or a lecture like this, uh, really is right at the beginning with a fundamental question. And that is, what is a bee? Now, happily, there is a simple answer to that question that is short and memorable and really does capture all of the key points of bee evolution. I'll share it with you now. A bee is a hippie wasp. A hippie wasp. Let me explain. The first thing to remember is that wasps came first. They had been buzzing around happily on this planet for millions of years before bees arose. Bees evolved from the wasps and they still look quite a lot like them, which is why the two groups are so often confused. But if you find yourself uh, being harassed at a picnic and your attackers are swarming around the, the fried chicken and stealing little bits of bologna from your sandwiches, well, don't blame bees. In that situation, your attackers must be wasps because wasps are scavengers and they are carnivores, constantly out scouring the landscape, looking for other insects to kill or pieces of meat to scavenge, to take back to the nest to feed to their larvae. Now, bees evolved from the wasps by taking a key dietary step. They gave up that lifestyle and learned to provision themselves and their offspring solely from the products of flowers. And once they took that step, they were off on their own evolutionary pathway and their habits and even their bodies soon began to adapt to that new life. They evolved long tube-like tongues for sipping nectar from deep flowers. They evolved wonderful branched feather-like hairs specifically adapted to the task of transporting pollen from flowers back home to the nest. Now, there is of course nuance to this evolutionary story. Some bees are, are parasitic on other bees and they don't bother collecting pollen at all. And some wasps like to visit flowers to drink nectar. But if you want to remember the basics of bee evolution, you just need to remember that they are the long-haired, flower-loving vegetarians, the hippie wasps. Now, all of this evolutionary activity took place a long time ago. Bees have been with us for at least 120 million years since the middle of the Cretaceous period which was a time on this planet uh, that was famously dominated by the dinosaurs. But if you can look past those lumbering beasts for a moment to the vegetation, you will uh, see something very interesting in that era, in that there were plenty of cycads and tree ferns, and there were early seed plants, even a few conifers around, but not very many flowers. Flowering plants were still a rarity in that landscape. They were bit players in a flora that was still dominated by spore plants and early uh, gymnosperms and other seed plants, early seed plants. So it's quite a curious place then for the evolution of an insect that relies solely on the products of flowers. It was rather a bold move. Now, uh, 
that sudden rise then of the flowering plants at that key moment when bees were evolving had always been something of a mystery to biologists and paleontologists, even to people like Charles Darwin, who was very familiar with the fossil record. And he knew that uh, you saw all sorts of you know, ferns and uh, um, you know, the, the seed plant, the early seed plants, the conifers, the ginkgos and so forth in the fossil record, but no flowering plants. And then all of a sudden, the flowering plants were there, they were diverse and they were everywhere. And he considered that sudden rise of the flowering plants, what he called an abominable mystery and considered it really one of the key uh, sticking points in his own concept of evolution as this slow and incremental process. How did the flowering plants arise so suddenly? That is a famous comment of his that is often quoted uh, about evolution, but what is rarely noted is that in that same letter where he made his abominable mystery comment, he went on to describe his correspondence with another naturalist of the day, a Frenchman uh, who was not nearly as famous, whose name was Gaston de la Saporta. Uh, and Saporta had written to Darwin, they had exchanged letters, and Saporta had come up with the theory that in fact, the flowering plants had evolved that quickly, and they had done so because of their interaction with flower visiting insects, particularly the bees. That was his idea. Well, Darwin didn't buy it. He didn't buy it for a minute. He preferred to think that the flowering plants must have evolved slowly and incrementally far, far away, and then dispersed rapidly to the places where they happened to be fossilized. Well, Darwin was a lot more famous, uh, and he had a much bigger beard, if you ever see pictures of these guys, and I think that really meant something in Victorian times. Uh, so his theory carried the day until the early 20th century, when finally enough biological fieldwork had been done to realize that, by gosh, uh, old Saporta was right all along, and it was indeed the co-evolution uh, of insects, particularly bees and flowering plants that led to that great diversity. And the, the, the results of it can be seen in any modern landscape. We've seen a complete reversal from the Cretaceous where now we look around and it is those flowering planets, that, those flowering planets, the flowering plants that dominate our planet. 95% uh, of our flora dominated now by those flowering plants. You can see it in any meadow, you can see it in the nearest flower market. But what is less well known is how the rapid diversification of flowering plants led in turn to an incredible diversity of bees, which range from the familiar, like the, the uh, honeybees and the bumblebees, one we, ones we probably know best, uh, to the uh, truly bizarre and fantastic, there are bright green iridescent sweat bees that you can see in your backyard, whether you're in Tennessee or Seattle. Uh, and there are truly bizarre bees, like a recently discovered species from Chile's Atacama Desert, which, which has a tongue uh, over twice the length of its body. Bees can be minuscule, like tiny cuckoo bees or sweat bees that are no bigger than a pencil point, or they can be massive, like the bulky oil collecting bees of Puerto Rico, or gigantic, really, like Wallace's giant bee, a leafcutter bee uh, native to the forests of Indonesia, that if you had one in your hand, it would cover the full palm of your hand, wings extended, a marvelous giant bee. Their colors, of course, range from what we're used to, the familiar black and uh, yellow stripes, to the truly fantastic iridescent purple. They can be red, they can have fuzzy blue stripes. Some bees even have stripes that scatter the light into rainbows of color using the same uh, really physical properties as the surface of an opal marvelous thing. So the co-evolution of bees and flowering plants has led to great diversity on both sides of the equation. If I were to sit here tonight and rattle off to you uh, all of the world's bees, this would be an extremely long lecture. You would want to bring a sandwich or two. We would be here if I uh, allowed 10 seconds, say, per bee. We would be here. I calculated this out. 
um, two days, seven hours, and 30 minutes to get through all of the world's estimated 20,000 species of bees. That's more species of bees than all of the birds and the mammals put together with room to spare. Now, if you want to put that exercise into binge watching perspective, it is, oddly enough, almost to the minute, the same amount of time it would take us to watch every episode of the Game of Thrones back to back. I calculated that out too. Uh, and similar to the Game of Thrones, even if we were to get all the way to the end, we would still have a lot of unanswered questions. And that is because uh, of all of those 20,000 bees, only a very few have been studied in any detail whatsoever. And perhaps thousands of species of bees are yet to be discovered. It is possible, perhaps even likely, that sitting wherever you're sitting tonight, whether you're in the Pacific Northwest or farther afield, you may be within a few miles of a bee unknown to science. How thrilling, truly thrilling. So we could talk about bee evolution and biology all evening. It is a deep, deep pool. But there is something else unique about bees that I wanna to touch upon, and that is their relationship with us. It's very unusual if you think about it. Why do we care so much about bees? Because people do care. I hear all the time about people uh, concerned with bee declines, which is pretty strange for an insect. Do you hear about flies in the news or, or cockroaches, earwigs? If so, certainly not with fondness. I mean, by and large, nobody trusts a creature with an exoskeleton. If you think about science fiction authors or horror film directors, when they need a terrifying go-to monster, there is a reason they don't choose puppies, they don't choose panda bears. Time and again, they find inspiration in the arthropods, those creepy crawly creatures, uh, any invertebrate that has a soft goopy body surrounded by a hard chitinous exoskeleton. The mere sight of insects and spiders triggers a measurable fear reaction in the human brain. And often the synapses that are associated with disgust also light up when we see such things. Psychologists believe that these are innate, instinctive, that there's a deep sense of otherness and danger about those brittle segmented bodies. It's as if even from a safe distance, we know that such creatures would give a sickening crunch if stepped upon. Yet, Throughout human history, in all sorts of contexts, we have made a special exception for bees. To be clear, bees have exoskeletons. They have waving antennae. Like all the other insects, many also have venomous stingers and their babies look like maggots. They do not hide their otherness. Yet, in cultures around the world, people have put those natural fears aside to bond with bees, watching them, taming them, tracking them, studying them, writing poems and stories about them, even in some cases, worshiping the bees. No other group of insects has grown so close to us. None is more essential and none is more revered. Now you might say, well, of course we like bees. Think of all the crops that they pollinate the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, the seeds, that depending on how you uh, parse the numbers, make up as much as a third of the food in the human diet. Well, fair enough, but that can't be the whole story because people didn't even understand pollination until the 19th century, yet our fondness for bees dates back millennia. To the ancients, they were the world's finest source, not only of sweetness through their honey, but also of light through beeswax candles, which was the cleanest burning source of illumination for thousands of years. Now, bee products also gave uh, the ancient world a ready source of, of various medicines. They were used, the wax was used for waterproofing. Bees gave people erasable writing tablets made from wax. Even some of the earliest and most reliable sources of intoxication traced to the bees, coming to us via fermented honey in the form of mead. So it's no surprise, really, that people kept bees long before they tamed horses, camels, or ducks. 
not to mention uh, familiar crops like apples, oats, peas, watermelons, even coffee, precious coffee came to us long after bees. We know that beekeeping as an art and as a science traces at least to the Middle Kingdom of Egypt because there are pictures in those uh, wonderful paintings uh, in many of the tombs there of beekeeping activities, sophisticated clay hives, stacks of them that were ferried up and down the River Nile in time with the seasonal bloom of various crops and wildflowers. Fantastic. So bees uh, show up again and again throughout recorded history and traces of their wax and honey are in all sorts of archeological sites from Neolithic pottery fragments to the world's oldest dental filling also made from a bee product. But by one school of thought, our connection to bees shouldn't be measured in thousands of years. It should be measured in millions of years. Millions of years. It is a relationship with potential evolutionary consequences for our own species, and certainly with one that has had consequences for a peculiar African bird. The greater honey guide is a brownish, sort of robin-sized bird that has developed the odd habit of seeking out people in the, uh, the back country all across Africa, seeking them out and leading them to beehives, hopping from branch to branch uh, with an incessant cry that the bird books describe as, ki 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 now, the bird ranges widely across sub-Saharan Africa, and wherever it is found, traditional honey hunters have learned to rely on these unique talents. For centuries, people assumed that the, uh, the honey-guiding habit evolved in co-evolution with another honey uh, lover in that landscape, the honey badger, also called the ratel which is famous for digging up uh, ground nests and even climbing trees to get at nests uh, to eat the honey. This was what people believed uh, for centuries really, until not too long ago when a group of South African biologists got together and they wrote a paper pointing out that honey badgers are mostly nocturnal and the birds are out in the daytime. Uh, what's more, honey badgers are extremely nearsighted, and if you put a honey badger and a bird in a cage together, they don't even acknowledge one another. In fact, nobody has ever documented reliably one of these birds leading a, ba a badger uh, to a source of honey. So to track down the origins of this honey guide story, uh, biologists like me had to go knocking on different doors, and I went to speak with a woman named Alyssa Crittenden at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who's made a remarkable discovery about the Hadza people of Tanzania, a group still living a traditional hunting and gathering lifestyle in the very landscape where our species is thought to have evolved. Now, the Hadza are indeed honey hunters, and they do follow honey guides. This has been known for decades, but Alyssa was the first person to ask a basic question. How much honey do the Hadza eat? How much do they eat? And the answer was surprising. Honey wasn't just an occasional treat. The men, the women, the children all ranked it as their favorite food, and they looked for it every single day, not just looking for uh, honeybee hives, but looking for at least six other species of bees that also make honey in that landscape. It was a major source of calories. When she added up the calories over the course of a year, she found that honey uh, made up fully 15% of the calories in the Hadza diet, a figure that was far higher at certain times of year when it was more common and higher still for the men who were the ones who did most of the honey hunting and had a habit of eating quite a lot of the honey uh, before they ever got back to camp to share it. So now that is interesting in its own right. But the idea becomes truly powerful in an evolutionary context. Because Alyssa and her team then asked another obvious question. Well, if modern hunter-gatherers have this relationship with honey, what about human ancestors? Would our ancestors living in the same way in the same landscape have behaved any differently? 
I mean, after all, we know that chimpanzees eat honey, so why not Homo erectus? Why not Homo habilis? Why not even Australopithecus? If we have been chasing after bees since the beginning, that certainly explains the behavior of honey guys. They co-evolved with us. Why would a bird bother trying to attract the attention of a nocturnal badger when there were big bipedal apes running around the landscape looking for honey all day long? But for Alyssa's team, the bird is really just a side note. The real story has to do with people because the story of human evolution has always been a story about brain size. And the brain is what physiolo physiologists like to call metabolically expensive tissue. It takes a lot of energy to run the human brain. As much as 20% of the calories in our diet go to fuel something that takes up only two or 3% of our body weight. It's expensive. So whenever you see one of those images of the, the increasing brain size of our ancestors over the course of time, anthropologists have always associated those jumps in brain size with some change in behavior or evolution that allowed our ancestors more calories to feed that larger brain. Whether it was hunting or whether it was cooperation or tool use or cooking, something that allowed our ancestors to in fact fuel that big brain they were evolving. Now, people like Alyssa and many other anthropologists believe that honey deserves a seat at that table as well. Let me read to you a paragraph straight out of the book with more information. Like hunting animals, finding honey provided our ancestors with a rich nutritional reward for completing a complex task. It would have created a similar impetus for the development of cooperation and sharing, as well as tool use and the mastery of fire. Hand axes, flakes, and other stone implements did indeed lead to efficiencies in killing and butchering game, but so too would they have allowed access to the larger bee nests hidden in trees. And while fire might have given us a nutritional boost through cooking, it would also have allowed the pacification of honeybees with smoke. If our ancestors did indeed search for honey as regularly as the Hadza do today, then each of these advances would have been accompanied by a huge surge in sugary calories. And Alyssa uh, reminded me several times during our talk that bee nests also contain larvae and they contain pollen, which provide even more calories as well as protein and important micronutrients. Taken together, these dietary contributions make a strong case that learning to follow bees and honey guides influenced human evolution, helping our ancestors to bolster their growing brains and, in the language of anthropology, nutritionally outcompete other species. Now, there's some food for thought. Could it be that our primordial sweet tooth led us to bees and to honey, helping ultimately to make us human? What a tantalizing notion. Now, if I were giving this presentation 100 years ago, I would stop now. Even 50 or 25 years ago, I might not have needed to say another word. But in the 21st century, it is impossible to talk about bees without confronting the challenges that they face. Colony collapse disorder appeared on the scene in 2006, almost 15 years ago now. And it decimated honeybee hives across North America, spread to Europe, and set off a round of research to scramble, uh, research uh, scrambling to understand why. I spoke with a bee scientist named Diane Cox Foster, who has been studying collapse, uh, colony collapse since the very beginning. She's one of the people who came up with the phrase. And she told me something interesting. She said that in the past few years, Colony collapse disorder has almost disappeared. It now accounts for less than 5% of lost hives. But yet professional beekeepers, those who know the bees the best, are still losing 30 or even 40% of their hives every single year. Studies of native wild bees have also showed a lot of steep declines including uh, the near extinction of what used to be the most common bumblebee in the Pacific Northwest where I live, live, the Western bumblebee, now nearly extinct across much of its former range. So what began as an investigation of a malady uh, that was afflicting one species of bee has 
really grown into a grave concern for what may be affecting all bees. And after all these years of research, really only one thing is certain, and that is that it's more than one thing. There is no single factor responsible for bee declines. They are suffering from what some specialists have begun calling multiple stress disorder. Diane summarizes those stressors, or the main ones at least, as the four Ps. Parasites, like the deadly varroa mite uh, that attaches itself to bees and to their larvae and feeds on their body fluids. Pesticides, like the notorious neonicotinoids, pathogens, including a host of viruses, bacterial diseases, fungi, and finally poor nutrition, which refers simply to the scarcity of flowers in our increasingly urbanized and industrially farmed landscapes. When you add climate change and invasive species to that mix, things get even more complicated because all of these factors have the capacity to interact and to amplify one another. In some cases, a, a pesticide that may be proclaimed be safe in laboratory trials becomes deadly when it uh, is applied to a field that also has other chemicals in it, traces of fungicides and other pesticides and herbicides, making some sort of cocktail that has never been studied. Hmm? Or a virus that might hardly impact a healthy bee can kill one that's already stressed uh, by parasites or stressed by a lack of nectar. British bumblebee expert Dave Golson uh, told me the issue really boils down to a crisis of bee health. As he put it, quote, bees are starving, diseased, and poisoned. Small wonder they aren't thriving. But he went on to give me the good news. In spite of the complexity of the problems they face and the challenges of the research into their problems, we already know enough to take action and to take action in very specific ways by providing more flowers and nesting habitat, by reducing or eliminating pesticide use, and by avoiding the long distance movement of bees and bee equipment that tend to transport bee diseases long distances as well. When we put those straightforward ideas into practice, the results can be transformational. And they're already being seen on many farmscapes, including some of the most heavily farmed places on earth. I toured an almond plantation in California's Central Valley, an intensively farmed area where most of the native bee habitat is gone. And even there, simply by, by installing a hedgerow of native plants, the orchard was able to triple the diversity of native bees in a single season. But perhaps the best news of all is that you don't have to be a bee expert to help bees. Anyone can do it. You can do it. We can all do it. You can help them with a window box. You can help them in your backyard, your garden, on a farm. It can be as simple as drilling holes in a block of wood to provide more nesting habitat or as satisfying as choosing to plant flowers that don't require any spraying or herbicides or pesticides. And if you do this, you will experience something uh, that can be pretty unusual, at least in my experience in conservation biology, and that is instant gratification. I recently uh, bought some catnip to add to the bee garden in front of my office. Uh, over the course of the summer, I had a, a spot open up and I, I thought catnip is a, a good bee plant. It's not native, but it does provide a lot of nectar and it blooms for a long time. I'm gonna put some in there. So I just went down to the hardware store and I got a couple of plants and I brought them home. And before I could even get them out of those little pots and into the soil, I had four species of native bumblebee on those catnaps. So it really is truly a situation where to borrow a catchphrase from another, uh, another situation, uh, you can say, if you build it, they will come. They will indeed. The bees are out there. They are looking for the habitat that you can provide. Now, in just a moment, we're going to turn things over to your questions. And I do hope you have questions, burning bee questions that must be answered this evening before you could possibly have a good night's sleep. Um, but before that, I want to read a short passage that comes from the preface to the book. And I think that it is appropriate to end at the beginning because we really still are at the beginning of understanding bees, the beginning of understanding their biology and their behavior, uh, the beginning of understanding our dependence upon them, and the beginning of doing what we can to help bring them back. 
So this begins with a uh, short epigraph from Henry David Thoreau, which reads, there are certain pursuits which, if not wholly poetic and true, do at least suggest a nobler and finer relation to nature than the one we know. The keeping of bees, for instance, is like directing the sunbeams. Bees today certainly need our help, but just as importantly, they need our curiosity. Exploring the history and biology of these essential creatures can transform anyone into an enthusiast, and that is the purpose of this book. But I hope you will do more than read it. I hope it makes you want to go straight outside on the next sunny day, find a bee on a flower, and settle down to watch. If you do, you might just find yourself daring to reach out and catch that bee, the same way my young son has done since the age of three, barehanded. Try this, and you too can feel the tickle of tiny feet and the whispery rustle of wings on your palm before you slowly part your fingers, hold the bee up, and set it free. Thank you all very much for tuning in tonight. At this point, Annie, I think we're ready to have any questions that folks might have. Perfect. Um, so I've been writing down a few as we go. Really quick, there's some people who had some technology and connection issues tonight, and I want to take responsibility for that. I am the technology gremlin. For those of you who don't know me or missed the intro, my name's Annie. I was the original director of the Center for Education, and I retired, and I took retirement very seriously and moved to a farm in the mountains, and I spend all my time with goats and sheep, and Joey realized very early on in the pandemic that I might need to talk to some humans at some point, and he invited me to help him with this um, event, and my guess is your technology issues are, I'm sorry, okay? So let's, let's get that out there, that's me. Um, so you ended on a very interesting note, and you, you spoke about this um, extensively in your book, how often your child worked with you with your, with your bee research, and particularly when you're talking about the cliffs, everybody gazing at the cliffs. I don't know if you've seen the durals on Corfu, where Jerry spends all the time gazing at the, the wall. It's a, it's a beautiful scene. It made me think of that. Um, and my kids go out with me, and we actually, we have a very biodiverse farm. We let the flea bane grow and we let the, all the native plants grow in addition to our regular stuff. And um, we use an app called iNaturalist to photograph the native bees. And then you can send them out into the universe. And if, particularly if you identify them incorrectly, someone will help you identify them correctly. Um, in addition to that, and you also mentioned bees of the world, what are some really fabulous resources for those of us who want to identify some of the native bees we see around? Most of us know a honeybee when we see it at this stage, but what are some of your favorite field guides for both kids and for adults? So they're great resources above and beyond iNaturalist and bees of the world with the fly on the cover. Well, that's a great question. And there is another wonderful online site where you can upload photographs called bugguide.net. Bugguide.net. And you just sign up and then you can upload your photos, not only of bees, but of other insects as well. And it really is frequented by a lot of experts who will identify those photographs when they can. So that's a really good one. Okay. Uh -huh. And then there is a, a there's a, a bumblebees of North America field guide now that is is good for the whole all of the the bumblebees across North America are, are in that uh, book well described well photographed uh, and also with nice illustrations to help identify them. And there is another field guide that's good as well for bumblebees that is available online from the U.S. Forest Service. I don't think it's going to help oh. you. It's not going to help you in Tennessee, though, Annie. It's only for Western bumblebees, but it is available, a full color PDF. It's a little booklet, but they put it online uh, for free. Um, and I think it's called A Field Guide to Western Bumblebees, but it's a U.S. Forest Service publication. And that's a really good one to download and have as well. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to try and work us through as many questions as we can. They're coming in now, um, but these are some of the ones that I wrote as you, as you were um, speaking. Um, and I, I've, I'm hoping that enough people have read the book to really enjoy the, um, the scientist whom you met on your travels as you, you did your research for your book. There were some really interesting characters. And, and as a scientist myself, you know, those are 
those are the best people in the world. They're fun, they're funny, they're esoteric and ignorant, and, and, let's say esoteric and excited about their subject almost always. Who is your favorite? And you can, you can, you know, maybe have two if you want, but who is your favorite of all those amazing um, bee scientists that you met? Oh, it's too hard. I can't <laughs> Sorry. possibly choose a favorite, but I, I will, I will name two just off the top of my head. Uh, and they're just the two, uh, two of, that I'm particularly fond of, I suppose. And one would be a, a man who's now deceased, Robin Thorpe. Robin mm -hmm. Thorpe was at the University of California, Davis for years and years and years, and really a, a, a wonderful expert on bumblebees of North America. So those bumblebee, that bumblebee of North America book, of course, he contributed to that. And, and he had this remarkable experience after he retired of being hired to do some bee surveys, bumblebee surveys uh, down in Northern California and Oregon. And he is the person who really witnessed the steep decline of the Western bumblebee and a related species, the Franklin's bumblebee, which may, he may be the last person to have ever seen one. Oh, but yeah. he continued his surveys right up until the end of his life every year, going out and on a quest really to try to find the Franklin's bumblebee, uh, see if it was still alive somewhere in that landscape. Uh, year after year after year, uh, just wonderful dedication, wonderful gentle fellow. He invited me to go with him in the field for a day and we had a marvelous time. We didn't find it and he didn't find it either. But now that he has trained up a whole crew of people who go out every year looking for that bee, hoping that in fact somewhere a small population is still hanging on. So I would, I would label Robin as one. Uh, and then a fellow who I, I worked with uh, on the paper about the bee cliffs, who is a great young taxonomist, uh, and taxonomist meaning someone who identifies the species and with bees or insects or really anything, it all comes down to the details. So you have to have a particular uh, sort of a mind uh, for keeping track of those details and noticing them. And he's brilliant at that. He's one of the people, in fact, who goes on to bugguide.net at the oh, okay. end of a long day of work, he'll go on and then just identify insects, bees for people, you know, for hours. He loves to do that. Um, and so he also happens to be a very talented jazz pianist. And I think there's something about that, uh, you know, the appreciation for detail and form that applies to music as well as to taxonomy. But he told me that after college, he had, had to make a decision and he was living in New York City with a group of friends who were musicians and they were playing gigs and playing out and doing a lot of jazz. And he said at some point he realized that while he was pretty good, he, he didn't have the depth of talent as the, as the guys he was playing with. You know, He was trying to figure out what he was gonna do with his life. Is he gonna follow his passion for music or is he gonna follow his mm -hmm. passion for bees? And he told me, he said, you know, he said, I knew I'd never be as good as those guys, he said, but I decided that if I concentrated on bees, I could be the best. And go. so he, that made his decision for him. And it's true. He really is a phenomenal young uh, bee taxonomist. Wonderful. Um, mine was the fig, the, the fig farmer. That was, that was my favorite scientist of the whole. Not that you, you know, need to know that, but I, it was, I thought he was very interesting. Um, oh yeah. Very, and very dedicated. I would not farm figs. I've discovered um, so let's move on a little bit to obviously a couple of different questions about the decline of bees and kind of the, the issues that they're facing. Um, and for those of you who missed the intro, I'm a, a honey beekeeper, um, but I'm non-migratory. So my bees stay here all the time. Um, and then Tor works mostly with native bees. Um, for honeybees, one of the biggest things that we find for those of us who are smaller is the travel, is the big operations that are doing you know, what we call migratory or transportation beekeeping. And they start in one spot and they, they follow the fall. There's a really actually a lovely book called Follow the Bloom. I don't know if you've read it, but it's um, about these people who travel around. And we, um, they, we're a bit of a the have and have not in that we, you know, they tend to bring a lot of diseases back to us and, and, and a little bit of, of some, some health issues and some things like that. And so we see them as a, as a major issue for honey, local honeybee um, farms. Do they have the same impact on the native bees when they bring those, those you know, kind of bees who've been 
you can almost, for those of you who are listening, you can almost think of it as a, um, a promiscuous um, business. They go somewhere and they're, they, they go basically to the almonds in California for here, they go to some pepper plants in Florida and all the bees are in one area. I mean, we're talking millions and millions. And then they come back and they come back with everybody else's disease. Um, does that, do those transfer over to the native bees? Is that an issue for you as well? And if not, what about um, the pesticides? Are the pesticides an issue for you as well? Are you facing those issues? Like what are, what are the big ones for the native bees, not just the honey bees? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And that's one of the reasons that uh, there's concern about the, the mass movement of bees and bee equipment over long distances because they do take disease with them. And there are good examples now of, in fact, uh, bee diseases transferring from or, uh, honeybee populations out into uh, native bees. It does cross over, at least. Okay. Um, most of this has not been studied, so it's all still new. But there are some instances now where uh, scientists are, are quite sure that some things have, have crossed over from honeybees to native bees. So it, it really is a problem across the board, but it's a tricky situation because of the way we've developed our agriculture. We have farmers mm -hmm. who really rely upon honeybees in, in mass during a blooming period when you've got a, a crop like almonds, a million, over a million acres of almonds in a place right. with a few bees. They rely upon the uh, commercial uh, beekeepers to bring the to bring their hives. So it really is a complicated situation oh. for farmers. You can't just uh, turn that mm -hmm. off and still have right. a crop. Right. So it's, it, but it is certainly a concern in, for native bees as well as for the honeybees is the movement, that mass movement and how diseases are moving right. around, right. not just across the, the country, but even there's even still some international right. transport that, that can move diseases as well. Okay. So this is a little bit of sensationalism, but it has been a lot on the news when we're talking about international transportation. I'm going to ask you about the murder hornets. Um, and they're not an issue. We've, we've talked about them a lot in our honeybee community. And, and generally speaking, we're not worried about them, particularly not on the East Coast. Um, and actually, at one point in your book, you speak of tying little um, feathers onto your bumblebees. Well, there was an article that actually came out last night about the murder hornets where they were trace, trying to trace them back to their nest. Did you read this one? And they were tying little transmitters to them. And I was like, oh, let me tell you, you should have talked to Tor. So <laughs> can you talk to us about the murder hornets and kind of your, your take on them and, and what you think the future is of that? Or if there's a future, how do you feel about it? Sure. It's a great, it's a great question. It's a concern right here where we live because it's just down the road uh, in, in Blaine where they've they, where they've become established, at least, you know, at least one or two nests. We don't know how many, a few up in BC as well. Um, it's, it's certainly a concern. There's, it's worth making the effort to eradicate them. Uh, yeah. And I'm good friends with, uh, <laughs> with a, an entomologist uh, leading that charge. And it is very tricky, just as we had trouble keeping right. the feather on the bumblebee, the right. transmitters keep falling off these darn hornets. Uh, so they're very hard to track, but they're they're working on it. the The concern is it's it, you know biologically it's very interesting in that murder hornets, these giant Asian hornets, evolved to be specialist predators upon uh, social in highly social insects yeah. like honeybees or like social wasps, yellow jackets, and other you know mm -hmm. uh, species that live in these big colonies. And part of the reasons the murder hornets are so big and tough is they've evolved that behavior. Not early in the season, when, there are, when their, their colonies are rather small, they're just hunting whatever they can find. They'll take uh, caterpillars and you know, a whole variety of things. But later, when the murder hornet colony gets large uh, in their cycle, which is the same cycle that you know, bumblebees and, and yellow jacket hornet, you know, uh, various hornets and things follow, they start with, from a single queen in the spring and then they build into a large colony. Then they have a mating flight and it's the queens that winter over and start the whole thing over. So it's the end of that cycle when they're a big colony, they've got a lot of larvae to feed that suddenly that behavior kicks in and the, the mm -hmm. workers then go out and they look for, they specifically then hunt for mm -hmm. uh, honeybee hives or paper wasps or other 
social insects where they can barge in and decimate it. They're so big, they, they're impervious to the counterattack right. in most cases. There are situations in Asia where, uh, you know, some of the bees have, have developed really interesting ways of, of swarming over the top of these hornets and, and Eat them, yeah. smothering them or overheating them. Uh, it's fascinating. We, we don't have that behavior here because they're not native. There's no co-evolution. So they really can wipe out thousands of individuals right. rapidly. The question remains though, whether or not they would really find enough to eat here where, they, where they've where they become established. It would probably be more problematic if they were down your way in the South right. where things are warmer and yeah. where the season is longer and where there are more social insects around for them to feed upon. Here in the Pacific, the rainy Pacific Northwest, we don't have great bumble or great uh, honeybee habitat. You know, we have beekeepers yeah. them around, but it's a challenge to keep your bees going in this fog. Mm -hmm. out. Uh, and so there aren't as many around uh, and there are fewer of, of some of the other food sources they might have at that point in the season. So it's still a question to some scientists at least of whether or not they'll even be successful, even if we were to ignore them. Right. But I think from the perspective of beekeepers uh, who need to have, uh, you know, healthy hives, and then also people interested in native bees who are worried about the social species like the, right. the bees or, you know, uh, social wasps are not as popular as bees, but they're still important. Right. Biologically. <laughs> so our yellow jackets and paper wasps and so forth. Uh, it's definitely worth the effort of trying to nip this thing in the bud. And if we can find those few colonies that have become established to, to wipe them out before they have a chance to get established because they would right. potentially uh, do a lot of damage. So we have a very similar system with or um, niche that's filled in this area with yellow jackets. In the early season, the yellow jackets are completely harmless. But by the end of the season, when they're in that desperate mode to get through the winter, they'll come through and wipe out an entire beehive of mine. If they find one that's weak enough that can't fight them off, they'll in a day wipe out an entire. So it's that niche is there here. Um, it's very interesting. Um, so moving on, let's see here. They have a really interesting question about the role of bees, native bees, with the indigenous cultures in North America. In your book, you, you talk very well about um, indigenous people in, in Africa and the, their relationship with bees. Was there any relationship with um, bees and indigenous cultures here in North America prior oh. to European conquest, <laughs> invasion? <laughs> Excellent question, and the answer is almost certainly yet yes, in that uh, wherever you have you know bees in the landscape that are producing something sweet, be it honey, which is you know the honeybees and various species, the more social ones, uh, uh, bumblebees as well produce small amounts of it. It's almost certain that people were eating that because it's so sweet, and there's nothing better in the landscape. But in North America, we lack the truly uh, highly social bees like a honeybee or like a, some of the stingless bees of the tropics. So there was not a sophisticated sort of domestication process going on or even a sophisticated honey hunting habit. It was probably much more opportunistic because there weren't, it wasn't quite such a trove if you found a nest. You might get a taste from a bumblebee nest, but you're risking stings in doing so. And so, you know, it's, people do it uh, uh, still, but it's it's not quite uh, what you get in terms of a caloric intake as you would from honeybees or one of the bigger honey producers. But if you just start traveling south and you get into some of these areas in the Americas where there are more highly social bees, particularly species of stingless bees, which are very common as you go south into the more tropical parts of southern Mexico and down into right. central and down into the Amazon, of course, then you do indeed find a, a tradition of domestication, sophisticated hives. Uh, it was all happening there, not with honeybees, but with stingless bees. Even better, because you get all this great honey and you can't get stung. Uh, and there is still a, a, a tradition in parts of Guatemala and southern Mexico where they, or there are a few people still practicing these old Mayan techniques. Right, yeah. Beekeeping of, uh, well, they, the royal ladies and, and a couple of other species uh, in that landscape. Uh, very... Yeah fascinating 
stuff still going on to a small degree. So the answer is yes and no. I mean, yes in the Americas, less so in the northern part of, of the Americas where there weren't many highly social bees. Okay. Um, there's two question here. Sorry, I'm reading really quick. Um, and this is this is actually a really interesting one um, because, and you, you address this a little bit in your book, the somewhat false dichotomy of you can have native versus honeybees um, and, and this kind of, this, this relationship of, you know, do you wanna do one? Do you wanna do the other? What are your options and things like this? And this person, um, says, let's see, do you see the role of beekeepers in helping protect native bees? Um, and is it kind of a gateway into supporting native pollinators too? And how would you engage people to care for native bees as well as honeybees? And that's a really interesting one. Um, just, just in terms of in the media, you see a lot of like, it is one or the other. And, you know, and I, I know as a honeybee keeper, no, I am not a normal honeybee keeper I have a conservation biology background, but it is an interesting concept because we often can be very focused on what we're planting and how we're planting, how we're harvesting and what we're doing. Do you see a, a middle ground? Is there something that you can do that can help native bees and honeybees and hummingbirds and other pollinators. You know, your, your wasps are around here. Our wasps are also pollinators um, and, and your moths and your, your butterflies and all those groups. Is there, is there something in the middle? Do you see a path forward down that? Certainly, the, it is really false to think of it as one or the other because the steps that one takes to, pr to uh, promote pollinator conservation benefit all. Uh, yeah. in terms of, you know, the things that we were talking about earlier, reducing or eliminating pesticides and creating more habitat. Um, there can be competition between right. domestic honeybees and native bees, certainly. And, if, and one of the things to think about in terms of beekeeping as a hobby with domestic bees is not simply to get domestic bees in your yard, but think about what they need. You see, mm -hmm. and, and so if one only brings in, uh, you know, hives of thousands of bees without also planting for them, you've introduced a whole bunch of hungry creatures into a landscape that's probably already scarce with flowers. And so it's very important whether you're conserving uh, native, pot, native bees or you're thinking about uh, your honeybees to think of a, the complete habitat that they need. It's not yes. just a place to nest, but they also need food. That many of them need a source of water nearby. So you think about the complete habitat and manage for that. And then you start benefiting all sorts of things. Um, the place where I see the most conflict that I think is legitimate really between uh, domestic uh, honeybee keeping and uh, native bees has to do with what you were mentioning earlier with some of the, the very large operations, which again are really critical for, for our farmers, um, after those seasons, whether it's apples or, or the peppers that you were mentioning or the almonds or what have you, uh, oftentimes the, the beekeepers need a place to pasture these bees, if you will. Yeah. And there's a tradition of taking them up here in the West, up into the mountains. Uh, and this is a situation where the habitat is limited in these alpine meadows and by introducing massive numbers of hungry uh, honeybees, you can really see the effects of that competition right. on, on the native bees. Less so with the hobby beekeeping scale that you see right. in, yeah. in, in backyards and rural areas. It's, it's, it's a really a different scale. You're introducing right insects, but at a much different scale and the habitat is quite different. So where I, at least for most of the uh, native bee specialists that I talked to, that is a, an area where they are concerned. What do you do with these massive numbers of bees? Where do you put them when they're, they're still hungry after the, uh, the yeah. apples are done blooming? Where are you gonna put them? And are they gonna be in competition with native bees there? That's a good point. That's a good. One. Um, and we actually a very specific question. Can you speak about um, mason bees a little bit? And for those of you who haven't read the book, you really should. He does a wonderful job. And then we talked about this a little minute ago about the fabulous scientists you meet. He um, met the gentleman who came up with the honey, the mason bee 
shelters that are so ubiquitous now. Um, he came up with the, the original ones and it's a really fun chapter. So I encourage everyone to read it. Um, but can you give us a, a Mason Bee 101 or what's your favorite Mason Bee trivia? Tell us a little bit about Mason Bees, please. Well, Mason Bees are a marvelous pollinator and one of those native bees that people are coming to know more and more for use mm -hmm. in pollinating, particularly fruit crops. Right. Uh, you can buy them in garden stores and so forth now, and uh, they're widely available and they're, they're delightful, delightful creatures, almost completely harmless, uh, really. I mean, you, if you really, really work at it, you can get stung, but even if you get stung, it's not right. very much. <laughs> um, so they're quite delightful. There, again, is some worry about moving mason bees long distances, right? In, in that right. it's easier to rear them in the Southwest and places that's drier and then sell them far and wide. There's a, a movement towards more local sourcing of, of, of native bees. So you're not, again, taking okay. the risk of moving diseases around. So that if you have the option, finding a local source or what's also quite fun to do is simply provide the other parts of, of the habitat Put out some empty oh. tubes, if you will, uh, and make sure you've got flowers in the spring when they, you know, it's, it's your orchard or your flower bed or what have you. Um, and the local mason bees that are already there in the landscape are likely to find them. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually begin with the, the bees in your neighborhood and through a careful management, increase that population by supplying the tubes and, and managing them. There are many uh, resources online and books and so forth to give you the details of how to do that. The best way really is those paper tubes that can be discarded at okay. the end of the season. And that, so I was just gonna say that one of the, the, the worries in using some of the, uh, reusing wooden blocks is that they can build up okay and so forth. So paper right. tubes are the way to go, but you can build up your population with a bit of patience and, and uh, uh, initiative right there in your own backyard because the bees are around. And so if you start right. providing more habitat, their numbers are likely to increase. So you can do it on your own or you know you can of course buy whatever you can locally sourced uh, mason bees and have fun with them that way too. That's great. That answers actually two questions we had, which was one was how do we clean the, the habitats at the end of the season? And, and you're saying just toss them and, and get new ones. That's, that's excellent. Um, from a parent's perspective, great, wonderful. Um, and then two was, you know, try to, instead of having, buying non-native bees and, and bring mason bees even, um, bringing those in to just go ahead and create the habitat. And if you build it, they will come. Your native ones will come. Very interesting. Um, and I, I have, I'm assuming Joey will cut us off at some point, but, but I'm just going to keep going. Is that okay with you? Are you comfortable with a few more minutes of Q&A? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, wonderful. <laughs> so this is actually one that comes up, I think, very frequently for me as a beekeeper. And I think everybody who gets into conservation biology, three to five favorite plants. And I think we'll stick with Pacific Northwest on this one. If anyone wants a different um, bioregion, ecoregion, let us know. And I think between Tor and I, we can probably help you out. Three to five plants that will help native bees. Oh, for an urban yeah. ecosystem. So this person would actually said for an urban ecosystem. Um, so three to five best plants for an urban habitat for native bees. Fabulous question. And I want to mention a great source online so that people can get more details than we can go into now. And that is the Xerces Society, X-E-R-C-E-S dot -E org, Xerces. Uh, they actually have fact sheets you can download that are regional, right. mentioning a whole bunch of, of good pollinator plants that you can plant it wherever you are. And they're, they're specific to, re to the region. So that's a really good source. Um, if I were to list my favorites, that's tricky. But for the Pacific Northwest, I really enjoy some of the early blooming things. Our, our uh, springtime bees are, are fascinating and, and diverse and so much fun to see after the, the long winter uh, that I highly recommend uh, shrubs in the genus Ribes, which is the uh, currants and gooseberries. So the red, right. flower, red flowering currant, which is one of our early spring bloomers with mm -hmm. beautiful pink flowers. It will do wonders for your bumblebees uh, and other early bees, as well as hummingbirds. You'll see hummingbirds on it like mad. Um, and shortly after, 
you will have blooms on another uh, species in that genus locally, the coast uh, black gooseberry, which yeah. is a little spikier. The flowers aren't as beautiful, but it's worth putting it into your shrubbery because it continues after uh, and, can, and attracts bumblebees, of course, as well, uh, as a number of interesting uh, fly mimics of bees. You'll see things that you think right. are a bumblebee and realize, my God, it's a fly. Uh, mimicking the bumblebees, as well as wasps and all kinds of cool uh, pollinators. So I, I highly recommend those two for the early spring. And then if you can get your hands on some Douglas Aster, which is a native oh, yeah. aster, very beautiful. Um, this is, I'm sort of bookending the season with these records. Yeah, because asters are what me sure in the middle. But if you get those early ones and then you can fill it in in the middle and then towards the end of the season, which in our neck of the woods is a time when flowers are scarce. Right. Uh, it, in the summer, uh, things get scarce. It's really a spring flora. So bees are hungry later in the season. And Douglas Aster, if you can keep the deer off it, is prolific and fabulous. It's beautiful. So you want to see it. Um, it's easy to grow if you've got the space for it and you don't have deer uh, munching it. And it's wonderful for bees of all sorts. And it is also uh, terrific for butterflies. You'll see so many of our little uh, skippers. Uh, yeah. So you can't believe it. Um, so those would be my three. I'd get the okay. rye for the early and then I would get Douglas Aster for the late and you can fill in the middle with all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and I would say for anybody who's not in the same area, it's it's the same for pretty much anywhere you're in. The middle of the bloom season is not an issue for bees. And if you're wanting to plant something for bees, um, very early spring and late summer is that will have the most beneficial impact on both native and um, honeybees. For me, um, honeybees, um, those, those are the times when bees starve. And that's when the times when there's not enough food and when there's competition for predators and when there's fluctuations in the weather and things like that, that are, that are very detrimental to them. So if you're, no matter where you are, what ecosystem as well as what human ecosystem, rural, suburban or urban, um, those bookends, as you mentioned, are truly what's um, important. Um, this is a question for me because I worked so hard and so long in climate change and um, kind of educating about that. Are you seeing, we're seeing a lot of impact with climate change with honeybees in that um, with these extreme weather fluctuations and honeybees wake up in really strange warm February days and they go out and there's nothing to eat and they've spent all these resources waking up and breaking what they call cluster and then they have to get back in the cluster and it's very hard on them um, and we're losing in the south we lose a lot of our colonies to that to early spring starvation. What are some of the impacts of climate change on our native bees? Are you seeing anything you know, is there any research being done? Are you seeing any any real good information on kind of what's going to happen and what is already happening with them? Great question. And one of the chief concerns has to do, well, in addition to what you mentioned with extreme events, which are, can be devastating for bees, also has to do with timing, with what mm -hmm. they call, you know, phenology, the timing of, of events right. in the future. And the way that different groups respond differently uh, to, to cues in nature in terms of when they become active or, or what triggers them. So bees often will respond to temperature, but some of the, the flowers they might rely upon might respond more to light right. or, or the temperature might be changing faster uh, in the places where they forage than it is in the ground places where they nest. And so one of the, the concerns for bees is what they call timing mismatch, where yeah. you see these things changing at different rates and particularly for the specialist bees, not as much for something like a bumblebee, which will find any old flower out there if it comes out at a different time, it'll find something, eats all kinds of stuff. But where you have these specialized relationships between particular plants, even down to the yeah. species level of groups of plants and particular species or groups of bees, when those things get off, there's a real worry about the long-term consequences. Because if bees feed on a specific flower and they are no longer overlapping with that flower in the way they used to, where the, right. the overlap is becoming shorter and shorter because say the flower is blooming earlier and the bees are still on the old schedule or, or vice right. versa, whatever it happens to be. Um, 
that can lead to starvation bees very quickly because they don't have enough time to complete their cycle. Yeah. So that can have a real population level effect. And that is one of the chief worries right now for native bees is particularly for those specialists and what's happening to them. A lot of research going on on that right now. Interesting, very interesting. Um, two, I'm gonna combine two questions. And one of them was, can you talk about the um, hive structures and particularly the comb and the hexagon? And there's another question, um, do all bumblebees nest in the ground? And can you combine those and just tell us a little bit more about bee nests? What are they looking, you know, we're, a lot of us are bird nerds. Um, and so we, we can identify a bird nest, you know, it's the species of the bird by the nest. Can you do the same thing with native bees? And can you tell us some, some fascinating nest facts and, and a little bit more information about those? Sure. Oh, nests are fabulous. So this, how much time do we have? Well, but, but a, Joey has not stopped us. So I know he hasn't cut us off. We're rolling. Uh, so at any rate, uh, what's interesting there is to, to realize that the uh, the honeybee, which probably has the hive we're most familiar with, with the comb, as you mentioned, and for right. storing of uh, not only for the larva, but it stores, you've got the, the pollen stored in there, you've got honey stored in there, that's really complicated structure. That is, is specific to those highly social bees. So you see comb okay. in honeybees, you see it in some of the stingless bees, a similar structure, not quite as, as uh, not quite the same, but very similar. <clears throat> um, so that's specific to those large colonies. The more common structure for a bee nest is a solitary situation. It is an empty okay. twig. It is a hole in the ground. It is a crack between uh, the, the sidewalk pavement. And that is a place where a single female bee is building a nest. And she gathers up the pollen and nectar that she needs to feed her offspring. And she makes what they call cells in that little hole or crevice, wherever it may be. And in all sorts of various ways, she might make them out of leaves. She might make them out of flower petals. She might make them out of mud. She might make them from sawdust. She might make them from resin from tree. I mean, you name it. And it's being used by a bee someplace to make a little cell. And then she will provision that cell with a beautiful little ball or soupy slurry of nectar right. and pollen. And she'll lay a single egg a single egg into that cell and then seal it off and she will never see her offspring. There's no interaction between the generations for most bees, right? And then she'll build another cell and she'll keep doing that until she fills up that little nest crevice. And then she'll go to another place if she has enough energy and do it again. So that is the typical lifestyle for bees is a very solitary existence. Now there may, you might find many of them together as you would say at a, a, a nesting block of mason bees, but they're not cooperating. Each one of those females that you see going in and out of a hole is specific to her little world. Her little hole is her domain and she's filling that up and doing all the hard work. The drone, the males, the drones, right. yeah. they're, they're <laughs> only there early in the season. They do nothing other than, than mate. They have, as in honeybees too, particularly large eyes. They're very good at spotting available females. You can see the, uh, the parallel evolution, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, among uh, many groups of males. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's the females then that do all of the work in these societies by and large, and, and they're solitary creatures. So you see a wide variety of nesting habits, everything from snail shells to, I once found a beautiful bee uh, nest in the grooves, uh, in a block of surfboard wax. Uh, so anything they can find right. that has the right, uh, the right width, they'll use it. Right, and bumblebees, they, they nest all in the ground or are there some that do and some don't? Oh yeah, sorry, great question. Yeah, bumblebee nests are sort of a middle uh, ground, if you will, in that yeah. they're also social, not as highly social as the uh, as the honeybee, but they build a nest usually in uh, in the ground, usually in an old abandoned mouse nest or something. So they're okay. always in the springtime. Then when you are out on your first walk, when the sun is just starting to feel warm, and you see bumblebees, and they're always down by the ground, going back and forth, mm -hmm. back and forth. Those are the queens that have just emerged from hibernation, and they are looking for holes in which to build a nest, to start a colony. Because bumblebees, unlike honeybees, uh, are on an annual cycle. Right. Uh, 
right? So they, they start from a single queen, each nest starts from a single queen in the spring, builds into a full colony, which might be a few dozen or a few hundred individuals, and then everyone dies in the fall, except the new young queens after their mating flights. They hibernate and then come out in the spring and start the whole thing all over again. So uh, bumblebee nests then around here are almost always in the ground, but they will also use other crevices if they can find them. Um, so old bird nests uh, mm. are occasionally used. Um, bird boxes will be used. Um, holes in trees, sometimes holes in, in the wall of a house. If they can get in, there's a, a hole and there's some insulation in there. It looks great, they'll use it. So what they're looking for is an enclosed space, usually with uh, some soft material, either something left behind by the previous occupant. Much more rare, at least with the species here, that they would gather anything themselves, although there are okay. some, some Carter uh, bumblebees over in, in Europe that do more of that. Uh, and then a few of them that will make uh, a nest above ground, but it's almost always in our neck of the woods in an old rodent tunnel of one sort or another. Okay, I think we're about, I'm going to ask you one more question though, really quick, because this person has been very patient, really quick, gold, great golden diggers, are they new to um, Western Washington this year? Great golden diggers, I can't say because I don't know which which ones perhaps you mean specifically? There are a whole bunch of of digger bees and mining bees out there, so I'm not sure with which the one? Question, which one that would be. But there's a great diversity of ground nesting bees in our fauna, so uh, I can't say for sure. Okay, well, thank you very very much. Um, I do believe that this is the the signal to our um, the end of our evening. I'm going to mute myself and see if Joey has anything else that he'd like to. Say, I did want to say it was great to see you again. I'm so happy that you're doing so well. I'm so happy that you're still writing because I'm still reading and I'm really excited to order your children's book for my kids to see, see how we can integrate it into our pandemic school curriculum. So it was good to see you again, Tori. Great to see you, Annie. Thank you. No problem. And it was absolutely wonderful to have um, both of you come visit us again. Um, you know, like Annie said, Tor, you've been uh, a part of this organization for a while, and we always feel great when we can kind of connect with you and, you know, find out what you're working on, because, you know, just like seeds and just like uh, feathers, it's always in-depth and phenomenal, and uh, I hope you're, um, you continue sharing your work with the entire world, because we're all a little bit smarter for it. Uh, Annie, you know, thank you for staying up. You can come back on camera if you want. You don't have to hide. <laughs> um, you know, thank you for checking in with us. It was great seeing you and hearing what's going on uh, in, in your existence out there on the other, other side of the piece of paper called the United States of America. Um, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't say everybody needs to go out and vote. And I can tell you who you should definitely vote for, bees. Bees, orcas, and birds. <laughs> They're the ones who really need our support. So uh, make sure you keep those in mind when you go to our, our ballots, uh, or your ballot places, or vote from home. And um, once again, thank you all for joining us. Um, you know, it's great to be able to connect with the people who live uh, everywhere. I saw names from Seattle to New York City. So we love it that we can use this space, this Zoom space. Uh, in this time of COVID to actually reach more people than we would meet otherwise. So um, have a wonderful evening. Check out, our, check out our website. If you want to share the program that we had here tonight, uh, it will be on our Rewind page. Just go to the Sewer Park Audubon website. You'll see it at our homepage and it'll be there. You can watch it on YouTube also. Good night, everybody. Drive safe and good night. Thanks, Joey. Good night, everybody.